What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of Debate Night. Um, we are back yet again, late in the season, but we still got some more exciting disc golf as we round things out, and uh, some great people here to talk about it. So, Brody Smith is joining us, repping the Florida Gators. Go Gators! Yeah, Defenders of the swamp. Oh yeah, I mean it was uh, college football started. NFL is right around the corner. Um, interesting times. Interesting times. There is a chance that uh, Ohio State. I got to put all my eggs in Ohio State's basket because it doesn't look like Florida is going to be very good. They have the hardest schedule mm -hmm. uh, in the country. Like ever. And, uh, <laughs> yep. Does not look. There's a a very high probability that we lose our last six games, which yeah. is definitely a sad way of going out. Uh, Raiders also thought we're, I thought they were going to be good. We're like not even favored against the chargers and their quarterbacks in a boot. So you didn't, didn't go with AOC. I, I, I hate it, but man of the people nonetheless still here. <laughs> I, I gotta say, you know, normally I just look at the comments on our last video, but Silas has been popping these videos out left and right all over the place. And, uh, man, some of these people, I think they just want to see six hours. I think these are the people that like watching like FPO play tic-tac-toe. I think these are the people that like watching Eagle play with their, his Kadama. I think these are the people that like watching drone shots of absolutely nothing. These are the people that like, I, I was shocked to see how many PDGA stands there were defending the PDGA and defending slow play. It is kind of crazy. Again, Guys, stop using the lame excuse. You don't have to be Isaac Robinson to have an opinion or to be correct about something. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. It's pretty obvious. If there's going to be 50 throws, do I want to see those 50 throws in two hours? Or do I want to see those 50 throws across four hours? Just wait. Hey. Just wait until like DGN starts going crazy with commercials of where now you just are missing a bunch of coverage and you just get a bunch of commercials. See what happens there. Cause that will eventually happen. So I don't know, man of the people though, uh, shout out to <laughs> shout out to Robbie. He says, right. People wrong spot for my picks last week, but I will say having been crushed by Isaac and events in the past, I do believe Isaac is very good at disc golf. Just had to make a pick last week. I'm going to be honest. I think very good is an understatement. <laughs> I think Isaac is excellent and potentially one of the best in the world. He's just putting it out there. Just making sure you knew. <laughs> um, we're also joined by Scott. Scott is back for another episode. Yeah, I'm glad to be back here for a second time. I feel like I learned some stuff my first time on and hoping to improve a little bit my second time. All right. We'd love to hear it. Um, somebody who has been here much more than two times is Gary. Uh, barbershop day for Gary. Let's go. Gary might be <laughs> frozen. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, I might be frozen, but can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, you're, you've got a smoldering gaze, though, right now. <laughs> we might just keep you like that. That's, that's perfect. Um, no, nope, just here enjoying. Uh, I just got back from a little trip to Massachusetts. Uh, I'm actually going back to Massachusetts tomorrow. <laughs> Um, but I'll tell you, if you go out there, Maple Hill's not the only course to check out. We stopped by uh, Mile Marker 63, Simon and Casey's new course. Oh, yeah. Incredible place. Okay. I, yeah. Do they have I, a clubhouse at that, that place yet? No, it's kind of like they have a small area where you can go like get some waters and like, get, get some snacks and stuff. In fact, they're really nice. We went in to go sign in, and they gave everyone in our group free waters. Um, so... <laughs> no clubhouse yet, but it, the court for what the property they have, what they did with it, with like the short grass being the fairway and like longer grass being the rough. It's just, it's beautiful. Sounds like a great time. I can really see you're very animated about it and passionate. Uh, feel free to refresh your webcam while Mike, uh, <laughs> Mike introduces himself. Yeah, how's it going? I'm a little worried if, if all these people keep making Brody mad, we're not going to have a man of the people anymore. So that's concerning. But um, yeah, not much going on here. Uh, this weekend, I'm the TD for the South Dakota State Championship. So shout out that tournament. Let's go. Um, oh, you get a nice little vacation. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I get a golf cart, so I'm super excited. I'll be driving around 
taking pictures, avoiding players. So it's going to be great. But uh, yeah, other than that, ready to go. Yeah. Repping Airborne Disc Golf today. Yeah, shout well. out Airborne. Loving the orange. Um, Gary disappeared off the face of the planet. So um, we, we may have to wait a second for him to join back in. All right. So we're going to get into our first topic now that we've got Gary unfrozen and ready to rock and roll. Um, so this is one that I thought of the other day. I'm, I'm very interested to get everybody's opinion on. So it seems like everyone is upset that the Champions Cup is not at a wooded course next year. That seems to be a pretty consensus opinion after it had seemingly attached itself to that theme in these past few years. So after attending Worlds and seeing firsthand the shortcomings that a wooded venue brings to the table, um, should we be rooting for a wooded major at all? Would we then just then be handcuffing the event to never evolve past a certain point as a spectator experience and revenue generator in the future? How do you weigh the pros and cons? Um, I just kind of had this thought the other day as I, you know, now that I've experienced a wooded venue at a, you know, high attendance event and, and all of the shortcomings that had, I was just kind of thinking to myself, you know, is it fair to even want a wooded major in the first place? Brody, what do you think? Yeah, it is a tough question because you know, you have all the OGs that have been playing disc golf for a while. Like this is, this is where disc, like disc golf was created to play with trees around. It was created to play in the woods. That was kind of the intention. And that's where a lot of people believe disc golf needs to go. Now I would agree with them that there's a lot of courses here in the Dallas area that are open that aren't really that fun. They're not very creative courses and the woods courses are a lot more enjoyable to play. The issue is like what you're just saying is like, there are a lot of shortcomings. The biggest one being coverage, like just there are certain wooded courses that it's very, very difficult to get full coverage of every single hole and having some blind holes. That's, you know, that's just not going to cut it. So, um, it, I, I don't know. It's one of those that I'm very interested to see 20, 30 years from now, what direction disc golf decides to go because on one hand, watching disc golf in the woods is very enjoyable. You have to see a lot of different shots. You got to see people scramble. And then on the other hand, it's like not a lot of people can see it in person. And then also certain wooded courses, like coverage is really bad. You like, you get a lot of blind shots. You don't really have any sort of idea. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Okay. Scott, what is your opinion? Um, how do you think the pros and cons weigh out? Uh, I definitely agree with Brody that there is a lot of fun to be have had on a wooded course versus a wide open course like some of the ones we have here in Dallas. Uh, I also think it's fair to mention, I don't think this was the PDGA's number one choice. You know, there is that pine beetle infestation where W.R. Jackson was. They're clearing out a lot of trees and that course is going to have to go under uh, a major redesign. I think that if we still had that course available to us right now, that they would be having it at WR Jackson. Uh, personally, I love Swenson Park, you know, the location of the OTB Open, and I am happy to see an extra round of coverage there. I think it's a great course, and I think it's one of the best ones we play on tour for uh how we see it through coverage. There's other courses that I do not think film as well. Uh, and I also think one thing that we cannot have happen at PDGA majors is what we saw at Worlds with cellular issues and live stream issues uh, at a wooded course. If that means we have to move to you know more open course, courses that can have more viewers in a place with better cell phone reception, then I'm all for it. Okay. So definitely some concerns to be raised, Gary, how would you address these? What, what would you think makes sense? Yeah. I think the first thing to realize is that we can do two different things at once. The, the question kind of creates that dichotomy of it's either one or the other, you know, you can either have a wooded major or you can evolve and make improvements. And I think we can do both those things because every venue offers some degree of challenge wooded courses just happen to be a little bit harder to film and they aren't always the best for spectators, but look at the most recent world championship. You know, you had one course that was wooded and one that wasn't wooded and which of those courses was more heavily praised by the pros, which of those courses received less negative feedback. It was 
the the wooded course because the pros loved it. And um, you know, because open courses bring their own problems. Time and money is being invested to figure this out. The Pro Tour has said that prices are of, of wooded venues are being adjusted um, to reflect that. They're working on improving the overall quality for live coverage. Um, and that the tour just needs to continue to adapt and learn from these scenarios. Don't wait till the last minute to check venues. But when disc golf kind of invokes the spirit of the game that we all love, you know, you can't cut off your left arm just because it functions differently. You know, this, I think you can painfully see the roots of golf in this kind of discussion because we take that same mentality of like the masters are always at Augusta and PGA championship is Parkland courses. U S open plays the tight, tough courses and the open championship does the link style. But, you know, I'll be the first to say that I, I want a wooded major. I definitely do. This, this stuff has to be planned ahead. They have to work and think strategically form a major committee. If one, isn't all there already and have someone on that on that committee's job be course viability have them start testing this stuff in advance and if these are supposed to be the biggest events in our sport we have to start treating them that way okay so gary's still seeing some light at the end of the tub tunnel for these type of events mike what are your opinion yeah so in all these individual sports whether it be golf or tennis every major has a theme that the fans know they love they can attribute to that major and really our majors kind of lack that i mean usdgc has the kind of master's feel of one course, lots of history. Other than that, I mean, I guess the European Opens in Europe, like that's consistent, but what are our majors really known for? And what a disc golf has been a part of our sport since the very beginning. And it's slowly going away in the majority of the case for good reason. But I do think it's essential that we keep it alive in some form for the history. I mean, when you look at tennis back hundreds of years ago, grass was the most popular court and now it's almost non-existent other than a couple of events, and one of them being Wimbledon, one of the majors. Nimble Wimbledon will never change off of grass, even though it's older, harder to maintain, and the play's a little bit different. And it's the biggest feature of that major, and that's why people are excited about it. I think we can acknowledge that wooded courses may not make the most sense for the majority of the tour, but I think sacrificing some revenue, some spectator ability for one major that keeps a very important part of our game alive seems worth it to me. And like Gary said, I mean, a little bit maybe too much faith in the pdga but if these things were planned a little bit more ahead or we put more investment or slightly more time into figuring out some ways around some of these challenges i do think it'd be possible and from the fan perspective and from the player perspective i think wooded majors still are important yeah i think that's sound reasoning um yeah the reason i kind of wrote this down is because and you know the broadcasting is is one thing um for sure but being on the course at a, you know, a, a high attendance, you know, in, in the realm of disc golf event on the woods, I saw limitations that you don't see watching on DGN. And I thought to myself, you know, because, because most of these, most of the wooded courses are just not going to have the same kind of parking situation. And, and most importantly, just spectating logistically, they did. They just don't. They don't function correctly to where I mean, spectating on Friday, especially at, at Worlds, was was near impossible to really get good views. You had to really struggle for it. And I just thought to myself, because I agree, I, I think wooded disc golf is not something that I want to just eradicate on merit. It's just this idea that we are basically going to take one event, and unless there is some very very serious planning or almost customization in wooded venue to like make it function differently you're basically saying this event can never have more than 500 spectators ever like that's just kind of how it felt to me and, and new london is not even the tightest wooded course out there like it is it's got some open hallways i thought that was interesting how before i had gone to that event i had always been quick to jump on it and then i kind of thought to myself well you know, as a major committee or somebody who's trying to make a successful in-person event by going to the woods, you immediately say this event will fail at X amount of spectators. It, it's going to be almost impossible to do. So I'd be curious to see what kind of creative solutions they could come up with to counter that. Um, yeah. What a disc golf. It's, it's, the, it's continually been the, uh, kind of the hot topic and, um, we'll continue to kind of see how they decide to combat that for sure. Um, so next topic here, as we are approaching the end of the season, we are getting very close to the playoffs. Now we have just one event um, playoffs being D glow. So as we get close to this kind of cut here and, and it's getting harder and harder to make the postseason and especially the playoff or the tour finale. My question here is who's one player you are shocked is so low in the pro tour standings being um, low as in 
bad position. And one player you are shocked is so high in the standings based on how you've perceived their season for afar. Somebody that you look at, you think they've had a decent season and oh, wow, maybe not so much on points and vice versa. Um, Scott, who do you have? Uh, so for my pick for being low, I am going with Corey Ellis at 54th. And I wasn't wow. just looking at this season, but I was also looking at his performance the last couple of years. In 2022, Corey had a second at MVP Open, a second at Great Lakes, and a fourth at Champions Cup. Uh, last year in 2023, he had a third at Portland Open, and he won the European Open. You know, he got a major win. Uh, at the beginning of the season, I don't know if you guys watched this, there was kind of a mini New Zealand tour down under. Corey Ellis was playing really good. He won two of those events. The third one he played in, he ended up uh, DNFing, supported like a young up-and-comer. But from what I've seen the last couple of years, and then with the start uh, of his season in New Zealand, I thought I was we were going to see Corey Ellis just start sweeping events. Uh, for a player that I'm shocked is so high, I only say this because I feel like there is so much talk about how he fell off, how he's not doing so great, how he's not the same, but that's Paul McBeth. Paul McBeth is ninth in tour point standings right now, and I feel like he does not get credit for that. The only players above him are Gannon, Calvin, Ricky, the Robinson brothers, and Kyle Klein, who are all, you know, leading this oh and a b but they're all leading the sport right right now and we're not giving paul enough respect yeah yeah valid picks for sure there scott um gary who is surprising you in the pro tour standings yeah so uh, seeing Kristen at fifth is a bit surprising given her dominance last year i think another big shocker for me is looking at cyan nanda dropping off from 22nd last year to 46 i would have thought with her win that we were going to see some some more elevated play from her the person who kind of took that spot for me though is rebecca cox because she was at 29th last year and she's at uh, 10th uh, so this could be a resurgence year for her looking over at the mpo side there's a lot of shockers over there joey buckets uh, 50 spots from 61st to 11th uh, with the Pro Tour win under his belt now. And I think we can all agree that when he brings it all together, he can win any weekend um, against pretty much anybody. It's not a shock to see people like Nicholas up 23 spots or Gavin Rathbun up 46 spots or even Casey White, who's up 29 spots because they're they're evolving with the game and they're getting better. And, um, but there's big shockers on the negative side. I'm not going to count Eagle because of the injuries and KJ and Conrad, the people who are not adapting and evolving with the game, I feel like. But there are four big names that stick out to me the first is nico castro down 54 spots uh he finished 17th at chess.com and it's been downhill ever since then uh, he's not having a good season he's in the 80s right now next is chandler kramer down 39 spots i feel like he's only succeeded at eight tiers this year and that stuff doesn't matter for the pro tour alden harris is another one he's down 35 spots this year from 13th last year his best finish is 19th and i think maybe he's having a rough time with the brand change and last but not least drew gibson down 27 spots to 94th. I thought coming back from, from uh, the injury, he was primed for a good year this year, but we just haven't seen it. And I'm going to throw out a couple of dishonorable mentions to Chris Clemens and Corey Ellis, uh, like Scott said. <laughs> Gary, Gary coming for everybody. Um, I mean, the question good did say good who is one player you are shocked uh, and one player, but I mean, that was like eight. So it's good only one. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's one way to look at things, but I feel like, I feel like I have to dock you a little bit for that, but definitely sure. a lot more shockers on the negative side. I, I completely agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. Mike, who, who do you, who surprised and stood out to you? Yeah, I wish I would have went before Gary because he sniped all 46 <laughs> people I had written down, but that's cool. <laughs> so, uh, no, for, for people that did better than expected, this is kind of a hard question for me to answer because I do feel like I'm kind of on the higher percentile of paying attention throughout the whole year. I'm watching the tour from week to week. So nothing like crazy surprised me. The Joseph Anderson going up 50 spots, a little deceiving. He only played like five or six events last year on the tour. Uh, I think honestly for like the casual, semi-casual person that is paying attention, I think the fact that Chris Dickerson's in 10th is pretty surprising. That's five better than last year. I went back and looked at Jomez. He was only on Jomez coverage this year at three events the whole year. So he wasn't really on coverage, but he always did well. You know, he had nine top tens, two podiums only missed cash once. And if you look at the standings, he hasn't played an event or one or two events of the last like six, like he's just non-existent on the tour. 
So the fact that he's in 10th is pretty surprising to me. As far as the lower, um, I mean, some a lot of them have been named. The fact that Nico's down so far is pretty crazy. He is kind of falling off as far as his prime and stuff. But for me, I think the most surprising would be Chris Clemens. He's gonna miss the champ he's gonna miss the playoffs or the tour championship rather, down 30 spots. His average finish last year, 40 or 28th place, average this year, 41st. Someone who we knew never really was gonna win an event, but always very consistent. Always you knew if you saw one, two, three pages of the leaderboard, you'd always see his name. The fact that he dropped down so much this year is pretty surprising to me. Yeah, I think whenever you have a guy like Clemens showing that, because he was a guy that seemingly had disc golf kind of figured out to the point where he felt like he was always going to do all right out there. When he's slipping, I think that really points to the strength of the field really increasing. Um, Brody, who are your picks? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to figure out how do I go back to see what they were in 2023? Is there not a way of doing that easily on the on the you website? Disc. You just like I'm on Andrew Art. Well, Andrew Marweed spoiler, it's gonna be my surprising one. I'm on his thing and I wanted to like it says event history. I click on it. My only options are 2024 DGPT and 2024 DGPT Europe. It would be really nice for me to select 2023 there. But um I, I I'm gonna go with Marweed just because I feel like in the past we know that he's obviously a great putter but he's always struggled or at least we've always thought he's kind of struggled on those open courses and we kind of just wait for him to show up at Idlewild, wait for him to show up at Waco. Uh, but looking at a season, he's actually been very consistent at a lot of events and ones that you wouldn't really expect to hit for him to like do well at, right. You know, DDO, he got 16th, you know, that is a predominantly open long course, um, so he's having himself a decent season here. He's in 21st pl place, which is really, really well. Um, all the names pretty much have already been mentioned. Uh, Nico, obviously Chris Clemens. I think a lot of people had big high hopes for him, especially coming into uh, Discraft this year. Alden Harris is a weird one. Very quiet as to like what is happening over there. But the one that no one said Silas Schultz. If you remember last year, Silas Schultz showed signs at multiple tournaments of like high, high level play. And yeah. uh, he's kind of sitting like towards the middle of the pack or like even towards the bottom and hasn't really popped off at all this year. A little bit of a surprise for me. I, yeah, I think Alden is surprising because he was a consistent player last year. And that's kind of what like he would, he don't think he missed cash once. Like that was kind of his MO Silas Schultz, I think was a guy who just didn't get hot this year. Like he did last year where he yeah. couldn't get those, those couple big finishes that, that really jump you up the point standings. But I think what we're seeing now is like, if you've, if you just can't like, if you mess up a little bit, you fall a ton in those standings. Mm -hmm. Like, and if you're, if you're just off your game a little bit, you just start, plummeting down the standing it, it is definitely getting harder and harder to make that tour championship and that um that huge bonus is going to feel more and more earned uh the further we get into this for sure um it'd be interesting to see how things pan out right on the bubble there um what, speaking what, of, go ahead sorry one, one really quick thing i didn't bring this up in mind because it wasn't part of the question but i in looking at all the stuff from last year and this year there was a 50 percent increase in um international players on both the top hundred and MPO and top 50 and FPO. So a lot well, of new European names coming into this. A lot of, a lot of new European events uh, as well there. <laughs> yeah. But this is just the, this is just the, like the, not the European points involved. This is just the. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there's still, there is still some extra full pro tours, but yeah. I will be curious to see um, as they get over to, to more events. And as those fields combine more, we'll get up you just get better and better gauges of kind of the strength of those players for sure. Those, those points are really significant too, because Paul was mentioned and I looked and basically half of Paul's pro yep. tour points are from just Europe. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He harvested points over there in Europe. Um, so speaking of other things that are uh, up for grabs right now. So we have just one MPO major left for grabs being the USDGC. So I want to know who needs it most to change the narrative of their se narrative of their season, whether that narrative is to win player of the year, break a slump, or just give a bad season, a pleasant note to finish on w which player does it, is it very important for them to change the narrative of their season? The most important, Gary, what do you think? Sorry, Mike, I'm going to do it to you again. Uh, there's a lot of good answers here. Um, the obvious one, uh, Paul Macbeth, you know, trying to improve his major count since his first major win, he's never gone more than two years in a row without one. 
that's a big thing for him. Um, AB is another great choice because if he wants any chance of winning player of the year this year, he's going to need to win that, that USDGC. But I don't even know if that's going to be enough because of Gannon's average finishes and Gannon's wins, which Gannon's also another good candidate for this because that would cement, I think 2024 is one of the best uh, years we've ever seen from a player and would definitely lock down the player of the year argument. And then you've got Ricky. So the drought's getting bigger. We're almost seven years now. And I think his relevance in the annals of history are, are, are being tested here. And a win would look more legitimate and legitimize and reignite his legacy. But speaking of legacy, the correct answer for this is Calvin Heimberg. Because every single year, the competition gets better. Majors are getting harder to win. And he has two wins this season. But the history books care a whole lot more about majors. Sure, Dan Marino is the best QB to never win a Super Bowl. But what competitor wants that distinction? <laughs> Not Calvin. Um, his last three events being third, second, and fourth, I think he's priming up for a, a really good USDGC, and this could be the year. But my hot take, I think, is going to be, and I've felt this way since the beginning of the year, I don't think any of the people I just mentioned are going to win USDGC. I think we're going to have a first-time winner, and um, I'm 100% here for it. All right. All right. Some early predictions from Gary. Uh, yeah, certainly a tournament that, you know, as much as momentum kind of goes in there, it can, it can be unpredictable. Um, Mike, what do you, what do you think? Who needs this to change their narrative and what narrative would that be? All right. I'm only mentioning one name. Uh, it was one he mentioned, but not for very long. So I'm pretty grateful. And that's Paul, <laughs> Mc, that's Paul McBeth. And I'll even be kind to him. I'll change this question a little bit. He needs to get any win before the end of the season to save his narrative. Okay. Paul's about to have his first zero win season since 2010. He's been given a ton of excuses over the last couple of years and rightly so for some of them. I mean, ha family, having kid, having injuries, but I mean, I'm kind of running out of patience on those at some point. They're not short term excuses and just kind of like the reality of the situation. At this point, if you would have asked me two, three years ago, if he was going to break Ken's record, it would have been absolutely for sure. And as we go further and further, it's looking worse and worse. You know, I, I was thinking about this question and I kind of had to laugh because Hunter and Trevor used to always love saying this. Paul never gets second. He either wins or he tries so hard to win that he falls a few spots. It's that killer inst instinct that he always had. But three seconds this year, a third this year, only being in the mix for one major so far this year, I, I can't help but wonder if the intensity is still there for him. So for me, major, that'd be great. But how about just any win for Paul to get him off this schneid and go so first time in 14 years without a win yeah yeah that, that's a that is a big deal i didn't even i didn't even think about that but that it would be a uh, a huge milestone coming up for sure um brody who do you think needs needs that usdgc title well um i mean i think what you said with paul is a good one because i think if he does win it that does a huge a whole lot but i'm reading the question and are are we basing it off of like what people are thinking right now? Yeah, like whatever their narrative would be. So yeah, the narrative being created by like the, who the needs fans. it to change the most? It most to change the narrative of their season. Like I don't really, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't really see tons of people being like, "When is Paul going to win? When is Paul going to win?" Like, there's not a lot of people being like, "I can't believe Paul is not winning." I, I I don't see that nearly as much as I did a couple years ago, because I think it's happened so many years now that we just all understand like, Oh, it's actually harder to win now than it used to be. Um, the, I, I, I think the narrative to me, one that um, has kind of gone quiet a little bit, but would definitely raise right back up is if AB's in contention. Uh, he hasn't put himself in contention in many majors. He should have won the European open last year threw that one away. So I think if he puts himself in contention at this major, I think the whole narr the whole, everyone's narrative will be, can he finally win a big one when he's in contention? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's definitely one thing to not play well at majors. It's another to get yourself into the mix and then kind of throw them away. Um, Scott, wrap it up for us. Who do you think needs this win to, uh, to really flip the narrative of their season? Uh, I'll start out by saying, I was talking to my girlfriend about being on tonight. She said, you know, who are you talking to? I said, Gary, I'm very nervous to go after him on this question. And I 100% agree with uh, Gary's answer of, Calvin Heimberg. I think that was a great pick. 
as well as Mike's of Paul Macbeth. Uh, I want to see Paul tie Ken Climo with 18 major wins. I don't want him to lose his 14-year uh, streak of winning tournaments. And I also want to see him be a fourth-time USDGC champion. Uh, but the pick I will make right now, because those two were taken, is Ricky Wysocki. We've seen the seven-year major slump. We've also seen him be an incredible player this year. I think he's second right now in uh, the Pro Tour point standings. He's been playing at an extremely high level. He's been playing consistently, and he needs this new major win in the new era to cement his legacy in the sport. He's one of the greatest of all time. And I think he's deserving of a win and I'll end it with that. Yeah. I, I, it's always trickier for Rick when he's having a really good season um, at the same time as having that narrative kind of chase after him, because yeah, then it's always just like, then it really just puts the emphasis on the fact that it's the major championships that he's struggling at, but there's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of players vying, vying for a win to, to really change things up. I, I would agree that that all of those are valid for sure um so one final topic here before we get into our finals um i want to look take a look at the pro tour schedule particularly the length of the schedule the amount of events because it's been a long pro tour season packed with events we've been going since the end of february and we'll finish in a little over a month net from now in october so do you think the pro tour should shorten the length of the season or amount of events or should they stretch events year round um but just maybe make more time in between them or different breaks or is it perfect as is how would you tweak this if you could and why how would you mess around with the schedule i know uh, we'll throw out different opinions on it um because right now it is a pretty long schedule full of a lot of events so uh mike what do you think what would you do uh, i actually think the schedule is well the amount of events and time frame is good schedule is a whole different story but the pga tour golf 20 to 30 events is about how many of these players are playing and it's about the same time frame actually they start a little earlier they end earlier now, I don't want to just say, oh, 20 or 30, let's do what they do. They obviously have better access to travel. They're almost all flying. I'm sure they all are flying. Uh, they have better access to recovery. So I don't want to say, like, it's the exact same, but around that 20th, 20 mark is probably fine. And that's about what these players are playing. They're all playing around 17 to 23 events. Um, if players are strategic, they can take breaks throughout the year. Uh, you only use 12 regular season events. I mean, Gannon already has six events this year that don't count. Or, or, yeah, he has six events that aren't going to count on his points. You, no one's forcing these players to play every single event. If you're a top player, you can strategically take breaks. Um, you can you know, not take the Europe trip. You can take two events off in a row, and you're still going to be about where you were as long as you play well. Now, if you're a fringe player trying to make the playoff or the tour championship, then you're incentivized to grind extra events, and that's how it should be. When you look at people grinding on the pro tour, trying to get in the FedEx cup, those are the guys playing the most events. And part of it is a strain on their body, but they just need to get better. If they want to play less events, it's just kind of the reality of the situation. So I will end this by saying one thing that would help a lot is a more intuitive and smarter schedule as far as where it's going, when Europe happens and things like that. But as far as the length and the amount of time, these players don't have to play all these events. So I think the schedule is fine as is. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And, you know, like you mentioned, there is that, um, you know, there's that part of the pro tour format now that allows for events to be dropped. And that certainly does help. Uh, Brody, how would you change up the schedule if you could, or if at all? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to agree here. I don't think I would actually change the schedule in the sense of like less events, more events. I would change up the schedule and like where we started in the country and where we went after that. Um, you know, also maybe not having back-to-back -back majors, also probably a good idea for next year. So that's what I would change up. And, you know, I think, I think Mike was right too. Right now we ha we're in this weird realm where there are a lot of people that are getting money that they didn't have. And they're trying to kind of figure out what to do with it. And, you know, there's still a lot of people that like don't have a house. Like they're making a lot of money and they do not have a house. So it's like, what are you going to tell that person? Like, don't go to the next tournament. They're going to be like, well, what am I supposed to do? I think if you asked a lot of pros, like what, what would you do if I gave you $50,000 right now, not to go to the next tournament, a lot of them would be like, I'd probably just still play. Right. So 
we're starting to slowly see a shift. You know, we see it with Simon. We see it with, um, we see it with Paul. We see it with Ricky this year. Ricky, I think this is the first year, maybe last year, a little bit that Ricky start started like picking and choosing tournaments. I think the big shift that we need to see really is obviously the disc golf pro tour. It's their job to kind of like hype up every event, but it's okay for every event, not to be the biggest event ever. And every event to be like, this is the one you have to tune in and watch. Like, I think it's okay for us to have some events where let's say Idlewild next year, let's say like, you know, only 10 of the top 25 people go to Idlewild. It's probably not gonna be a massive event, but it's still a really fun course to watch. And I think that's still fine. Be a bummer for Idlewild though. Hey, that, hey, I hey use, you can't use, can't have massive events week after week. It's just, it just won't exist. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it is it, a lot of, I think a lot of times the PGA tour seems like they kind of gather up momentum and then they have those kind of big events where they get everybody, whether it be the Wells Fargo or however they pick and choose. We, um, yeah. You know, what events are big and what events aren't big on the PGA tour. Yeah. You see commercials. That's, that's how you know. <laughs> um, Scott, who, what do you think about the PGA schedule or the pro tour schedule? I should say, um, do you think it's fine as is, or would you kind of change things up? Uh, right now, I think that the length of the season is fine. Uh, we have a few months off for players to go home if they're traveling in a van year round. Uh, what I would like to see a change with is how the European leg of the DGPT is handled. I don't think we could we should be in the situation where we have us and european events on alternating weekends or i believe there is one in the same weekend this year i don't think the sport is big enough to support that and i think we could see much higher quality with stronger strength of field events in europe if we could make that just a single stretch of the tour with no us events going on uh and Brody mentioned uh, Ricky, Simon, and Paul with the way that they're able to, you know, fly into events and pick which ones they're playing. But I think those are very isolated examples for, you know, the bottom hundred players in the field. I feel like we know how big those three players' contracts are, and it's giving them a lot of options and choices that just aren't available to the person who is hoping to make cash next week like it's their first year on the pro tour and they're just grinding by day by day uh so i think the length is good but i just want to change in europe okay so everybody rebuttal kinda... Go ahead. That was, that's our first like disagreement wait what 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 was the what was the statement at the end about the players at the bottom why does that matter at all that they're not able to fly into tournaments and pick and choose tournaments well, I, I may have misunderstood you, but I think you were saying that's the change we're seeing in disc golf, but I do not think that's the change we're seeing for the whole field. I think that's for, yeah, no, I agree 1%. with you, but no one, no one cares about those people. Hit them with it. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> no, if Idlewild, if Idlewild got the to top 25 players in the world to show up and only 15 of the 50 to hundred players and all the other were like less outside the top 100, it would be a massive tournament. If Idaho got everyone from 25 to 100, no one would care. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so that's all that's I'm saying true. is like the top guys, eventually they're going to Gannon, uh, AB, uh, Calvin, eventually these guys are going to get massive amounts of money in their bank accounts. They're going to get houses. They're going to get wives or girlfriends or whatever and they're not going to want to grind and go to every tournament week after week after week after week they're just not going to that's just that's, that's just the nature of the beast that's just what's going to happen and so they're going to pick and choose and like i was saying we're already seeing it with the top guys so it's just going to continue to happen yeah i think once there's once there's access it's definitely a natural progression so gary we're it seems like everybody's kind of in consensus so far here i'm, I'm a little surprised honestly that I thought maybe some people would be in favor of reducing events or changing the length of the season. Are you kind of in the same boat? Yeah, I think it's really important for pros to have 
uh, an off season for several reasons, you know, a chance to reset physically, mentally and see family. And I think contracts and sponsorships being changed and negotiated makes it a lot easier when there's like a cutoff point. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I would change much about the length of the season. I think February through October makes a sense and it's appropriate. Uh, you could stretch into early November if it's absolutely necessary, but ultimately the big issue is that subscribers are going to suspend their accounts uh, for the off season. So the DGPT has to ask themselves, like, do they have the resources and time to offer something that will fill that gap? And maybe yes, with things like the New Zealand tour, which I really loved, um, the DGPT Europe could maybe have some events or there could be some A tiers in places where there's good weather, but you know, I don't know that they have the resources and time. So what they should probably just do in the off season is lock it up and use that time to plan and prepare, you know, look for, to test new sites for coverage, talk to pros and consumers and get more insight as to what they're looking for. I think some of the tweaks that I would make personally is I would spend more time figuring out the European swing. Like everyone said, if you have to extend the tour into November by a couple of weeks or two, and that grants us a week or two of flexibility for the European events, I think that was it's worth considering i think they could showcase the q series a little bit better not necessarily the events themselves but maybe update the uh, the viewers on the battle for the tour cards what what well-known pro is on the bubble right now i think they could look for underutilized areas of the country you know one of the best things about worlds this past time is watching pros dissect new courses there could be a small group created to go find new worlds venues that check the boxes and then the last thing i would do is i would eliminate the uh the plus event designation it's an unfair point of advantage for the players who can attend all three of them yeah, the plus events, I think, was an interesting experience I'm, or experiment. I'm curious to see how long they hold on to those. Um, you know, it was definitely kind of a PGA Tour copycat move in the sense that PGA Tour is also working with I think their their idea behind their event was larger purses. We're going to get all the players to agree to come to them ahead of time, that sort of thing. Whereas the Pro Tour kind of went more in the direction of like, we're going to incentivize people with points. And there was some other bonuses here and well, there, but... Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just saying, this is the interesting thing is right now the PJ tour is having a difficult time having their top pros show up to events. Yeah. Which mm. makes events not yeah. as popular. And also, you know, if I'm a big sponsor of an event and you tell me tiger's not showing up, Ricky Fowler's not showing up, Scotty's not showing up. Uh, yeah. you know, the big names in golf aren't showing up. I'm going to be like, well, why am I paying this amount of money? So it's interesting because the PGA tour is pushing those elite plus events to try to get people to show up. Disc yeah. golf doesn't have that issue right now. And so that's where it doesn't really make sense. Like everyone's going to show up to yeah. Deglo this week. Oh, and like, I, and, and also the best in the world, like Kristen Sitar being example has shown like, I don't care if I miss Portland. Like it's fine. <laughs> like yeah, it's also and, true. Yeah. Right. So like it hasn't clearly hasn't been enough. Um, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, golf golf will always be driven by by the stars, and yeah, disc golf isn't really at that point yet where it's you're getting large. Other than during the Europe crossover, we get these weekend fields, but during well, the normal touring schedule, it's definitely not a factor. There's too many guys that are just on the road. Yeah. Um, Obviously, there's a balancing act to this, but people who are afraid of these weaker fields. Everyone always asks, you know, what's the point of these majors? Like, what's the difference between a major and a regular event? And then right now, I guess that's like kind of true in disc golf. But if the fields were a bit weaker in all the other events, that would be one of the things that make a major a major because everyone that's should true. be there. <laughs> when you yeah. look at like when you look at the strength of schedule or field on our events from 2023, two of the th four majors were like 15th or 16th in strength of field you look at golf strength of field and they're always like in the top six so well, like it would be right a, now especially yeah exactly <laughs> that yeah that, that's a good spin zone though hey if the fields are weaker the major fields will be more electric I, I, it is true and yeah it, it i mean i think right now what was our strongest field like waco it was <laughs> Like because they got all those those uh, Texas players that fill in the back end of the field and they're they're all like a thousand rated. So, yeah, it, it's it is interesting um, to see how that kind of evolves. All right, we're gonna move on to our final topic. Uh, Mike, you have a two point advantage on Gary. Interesting final topic here. Curious to see how you guys go on this one. So, Mike, would you like to go first or second? Uh, I'm gonna go first. Okay. Okay. This would be this would be electric if you guys have differing opinions. I mean, this is very much an A or B. Uh, if, I, if I knew if I knew we had different opinions, I'd go second. But I don't think we will. So mm. maybe mm. Gary, okay. you want to tell me what team you're doing? Yeah, I said you want to tell them. I think I'm on. Uh, I think I'm on team uh, team Young Gun. Okay. Yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the question. Um, so I've got two groups of players here. 
And um, Gary, since you're going second, maybe you know, maybe now, maybe now you want to try and craft an argument during Mike's for for the other team, try and sway us all. Uh, you can't but, you can't change your answer when you know you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. We basically have kind of the old guard, or uh, somewhat an old guard, um, a lot of the household names versus a, kind of a mock newer guard of, of players. And I want to know which group of players is most likely to win more combined majors in the next five years. I try to pick two groups that I think you could argue for either for different reasons and are a little bit controversial. So group A, we have Ricky Wysocki, Paul McBeth, Calvin Heimberg. Group B, we have Isaac Robinson, um, Nicholas Antela, and Anthony Barella. So Mike, you kind of alluded to it but but why what is your choice and why yeah i mean i love this question but i think you made group b just a little bit too powerful um we're gonna have the same answer so i'm gonna go a bit further group b wins without barella so <laughs> ricky has zero majors in the last five years paul he has four in the last five years but since worlds in 2022 he's only been in the top five twice and if we all be honest with ourselves it doesn't look like he's going to be winning many more i mean if you were going to do an over under on majors for Paul in the next five years, what would you be comfortable going over on? Like if I gave you the line one and a half majors, would you go over? Because I wouldn't. Uh, Calvin's average finish in non majors is eighth. Average finish in majors is 15th. Now Calvin's the one here that could mess this up because tomorrow he could decide he's going to win a bunch of majors. And I will, I will say that that makes it a bit closer, but if I'm going to try to guess here, I'll give Ricky one, I guess that'll be better than the last five years. Right. I'll give Paul one just because it feels wrong to say Paul will never win another major. And I'm going to be super generous. So I'm going to give Calvin two. All right. So that's four for them. It's a lot. <laughs> Isaac's had three in the last two years. And it's not like he's all or nothing. He has a fourth, a third, a sixth during that time frame. The fact that in the last eight majors, he has three wins, a fourth, a third, and a sixth is, is ridiculous. He's only 22. The next five years should be the peak of his prime, you would think. And in an interview after he won, he made it clear he's putting much more emphasis and focus on in the intensity he's giving for these. He made a comment that he can't give this much attention to detail on every shot, every single event, but he's going to do it in majors. So he's going to win some more. Antela, 23 years old, he's gotten second in half of his last eight majors. He's going to win some majors. Uh, Burrell is a wild card, like... Like maybe he'll win one. I don't really care if he does. He doesn't have the best performance in majors, but we'll give him one, I guess. So I'm giving I'm giving Isaac four, and that's the half the rate of winning that he's had in the last two years. So even if you think, well, that's still too fast, we, we can give him three, I guess. Antela, half of his majors, he's been getting second. He's going to get surely at least two in the next five years. And we'll give Barella half a major. So that's six and a half to four. And I don't even think the other group's getting four. So it's for sure team B. And if you say anything else, you're, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Very, very strong on a, on a team B, uh, Gary, you kind of seem like you're on the same side. Maybe you've got something else to bring to the table though. Yeah, we have the same final answer. A few different points getting there to that final answer, though. Uh, this is a fun thought experiment. I noticed that Gannon didn't make either group because that would tip the scale immediately in one direction, I think. Um, but I guess let's look at them because you got Paul McBeth pushing two years since his last major win. His putting doesn't seem to be where it once was. His game feels a bit off, and I know this is going to get me some hate in the comments. I think McBeth is done with major wins. I think okay. the field's getting too strong. I don't think he's going to win another one. Unfortunately, I'd love to see. I'd love to see him prove me wrong. For Ricky, uh, I think Ricky wants it more than any one of the six people on this list. But we're pushing a seven season without a major win. And like I said, prior see, prior his legacy is on the line. Um, but uh, it's going to be uphill battle for him. Calvin is like, uh, yeah, he's the wild card here. Uh, he may not want it the most, but I think he needs it the most. I think of the twenty majors ish in the next five years, I could see this group winning two or three on the back of Calvin. Um, for the other group, you've got Isaac, who is already a proven winner in the modern field. And uh, as he develops his game and these major courses align with his skill set, he's going to get more major wins. I think he's a must pick to win a USDGC in the next five years. I think he's got what it takes to do that. Um, you got Nicholas, who I think he's on the verge of the big one. He took a huge step this year for himself. I think of the three in his group, he's actually the least likely to contribute um, to the major total. But there's definitely a possibility for him taking one down. And when it comes to AB, I know he struggles with, with major finishes, but this is the first year that things have clicked for him. And now that he's tasted victory, I don't think a major win is very far off for, for AB. So of the next 20 majors available, I think they could win seven or eight of those majors. And the only reason I'm not saying more is because Ganon the Beast is not in there. And um, I think Calvin and them are going to uh, take a few themselves. 
But I think uh, the just Group B is going to be more consistent over the five years. I think they have the age advantage, and they're just proven winners in the modern field. I think this question would have been interesting if you would have taken out Macbeth and put in um, like a Simon up there maybe or even shifted Anthony Barella because how long he's been in the league in that group and put Gannon in the second group. But it's B every time. Yeah, I, I think the, the question, it really comes down to how much stock you put in kind of the, the major stigma because – in a reality where you don't really believe in that, because there's a lot of people, a lot of Calvin fans and Ricky fans that don't really believe in that. If you just think it is just kind of like how the dice have been rolled, then you could very easily convince yourself that Ricky and, and Calvin over the next five years could win six majors between the two of them. Like it's not hard to make that stretch. I mean, there are two players that have been two top five players for the last however many seasons. And then you could, just as easily, if you believe in the major stigma, you could just as easily say, well, Antle Umbrella haven't won a major yet. Who's to say they're not just like Rick and Calvin and they never win one in the next five years. Like Calvin or Ricky has done it for seven years. Like it, So I think that there is different ways to spin that argument. Um, but, you know, going, if you just, yes, I think if you just go with the gut feeling, it's it's always going to be group B there. I don't know. Brody, Scott, what do you what do you think? What group would you, do you pick? Would either of you what pick What the heck? I didn't, well, I didn't get in the finals. I, I just want to ask give you. My, you know, you don't get my answer. Okay, fine. Scott, uh, group A or B? It, interesting. Uh, Chat GTP said that group <laughs> A would oh, win. Yeah, I bet, he, I bet he did because it's like Paul won 17 <laughs> majors. <laughs> they noted... Uh, Group A's experience under pressure being a determining oh. factor in how many majors they would win. Uh, personally, I agree with uh, Gary and Mike. I do not see how that younger generation will be outbeat by Calvin, Ricky, and Paul as much as I'd like to see it happen. I think I, I asked Chad GPT to give me the top 10 disc golfers of all time. And it had Eric McCabe at like seven. Yeah. Can you yeah. just help me real yeah. quick? Is chat GT, is that just a uh, AI that pulls info from um, websites? Is that all it is? Yeah. yeah. If, if you yeah. have the free version of chat GPT, it only pulls information from like 2022 and earlier. So yep. that's also probably a big reason. And okay. if it sees gaps, it fills in gaps with like AI clouded logic. So it's not always. Right. Okay. And <laughs> it's also it's not, it's not, there's not a, um, there's not a lot of articles out there for disc golf. So there's not like there's people writing hit pieces on certain no. players and like they has it's when literally you ask just AI about disc golf. You get things that sound coherent to somebody who doesn't know disc golf, but somebody who does, you're like, that's a little bit off. Like, what did you just yeah. say about that? Disc? I feel like, like it, if it, you it, ask it, stuff about like one of the big four sports, there's so much information out there that it yeah. can actually give you a good answer. No, it's good. According, stuff to, to, mm -hmm. according to chat GPT, Paul just won USDGC. So I'm like, okay, there so. you go. That's, that's where we're at. The, the only um, way, the only way Group A is winning this matchup is if Calvin wins one major and Gannon wins nineteen. Yeah, that's the only way that that's happening. I, I had to look real quick. I think in terms of major drought, there's twenty four years of combined major drought in Group A. That's a lot. Of, well, yeah, there, there's a couple of players, uh, Calvin in particular, that's really contributing to that that drought. Yeah. Um, anyways, congrats, to Mike. Mike is our winner today. Great show, Mike. I. I really liked your Wimbledon analogy. That was really good. That's good stuff right there. Um, preserve the game. What is wooded course equal to uh, the grass courts? I actually saw a video the other day of a guy who like made a grass court in his backyard. He like brings people out to play there. Like it's it's legendary. Um, anyways, yeah. Congrats on the win, repping repping Airborne. Yeah, uh, I'll use I'll say two things with my time. First thing is. Uh, it wouldn't have helped me today, but petition to have the finals go back to zero zero. I think that would be electric. Give the chance for someone behind to get the win. Okay. Um, and then my other shout out is for myself, uh, PDGA. I'm going to look into the camera while I say this. Uh, this is my application to be hired. You guys don't know what you're doing. Get your schedule <laughs> figured out. Get wooded majors figured out. Uh, I will put my resume in the comments and feel free to reach out whenever you want to. Okay, there you yeah. go. I heard they got great benefits. Um, free PJ <laughs> membership. You can be what, part of the Eagle Club. What do you guys? What would you guys think? Because uh, Wimbledon's such a big, big deal because they only play on grass once a year. What do you guys think if that was disc golf? If literally there was I, I think Champions that, Cup was the only time we ever was, play in the woods. Well, as Mike was saying it, I could kind of envision this idea. That would be kind of sick. Well, I think they're like. Let me be clear. If there was 
assets beyond like if there was like real money in disc golf i think there's a world where you can create a wooded venue that does like imagine yeah, a wooded tree houses. course yeah tree houses we've talked about this well that that's that is one thing but imagine a wooded course where you've got five feet of woods and then there is like good spectator lanes yeah. or they are maybe just mm -hmm. like there, there are ways to accomplish it of course but i do think in the short term the sport could get pushed so much further in a different direction because of what we need to accomplish right now that, yeah, it, it is an interesting one. Um, I think our sport with how much the disc golf pro tour shows drone footage um, yeah. and, and they don't <laughs> actually use it as they don't use it as a replay. They use it as like the live shot for so many shots. Maybe disc golf's an aerial sport. So maybe spectators right now, instead of standing five feet behind players, that's not the best angle. No, the best angle is a hundred feet in the air. So maybe we need platforms. Now we're and talking platforms. Ooh. You know, those like weird um, museums where you're like, you're walking and the grass cr cracks and you like get scared that you're going to fall through the, the floor. Yeah. Just all glass floors, a hundred feet above the ground. Yeah, but then Sounds how is Kevin great. Jones going to throw his grenades? That's a good point. It hits the glass platform. <laughs> Could you imagine how electric it would be to have professional drone flyers flying drones behind discs through the woods? I will say this. Picture this. You're up Maybe on one of these platforms. The noise and they, would be they, annoying. They kind of shape it to where it goes with the <laughs> flight, and you're watching a hyzer travel up <laughs> like it's within five feet of you yeah. at its peak. <laughs> you can reach out and grab it, and then it fades. Like, that's electric. You can read Yuli's phone number on the bottom of that thing. Glass platforms, man. It's the future of disc golf. We might have to start thinking we about glass platforms. We just platforms. solved it. <laughs> that that could that could be the solution um anyways if you got any better solutions or any topics you can uh scan the qr code here on the screen or click the link in the description um everybody was lacking on the topic submissions last week i think i had like one so get in there submit some topics you've only got a few more uh tries before the end of the season so make sure to do so other than that we will see you next week after d glow before the playoffs see you then